church services, and she was startled by an intruder. A guy came in and came to her house, and she caught him in the act of robbing her, her home. Of its value, was, she said, stop, Acts 238, which Acts 238 is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. So she says, may be forgiven, but she said, stop, Acts 238. So the burglar stopped in his tracks, and the woman calmly called the police and explained what she had done. And the officer of the cuffed man, uh, she, he asked the burglar, why did you just stand there? And all, all this old lady did was yell a scripture at you. Scripture replied. She said hey, she had an ax in 238. <laughs> so that froze him right in his tracks and he waited for a police to come. He didn't want to, he didn't want to see her ax and he didn't want to see both of her 38s. 2 Timothy chapter 1, 11 to 14. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced, that's persuaded in the King James, that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to share the word with every precious person that's here and also with those who will see this on YouTube. And we just thank you, Lord, that, that you allow us access to your word. There's so many people in the world that are not allowed, that it's forbidden to them or they can't afford it, but we can just openly share the word still, and we just thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the first time we see Paul was when he was still named Silas, I mean Saul, in Acts 7 and 58, where he approves the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, and the people that were stoning him laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul, and that was that was uh, that was became Paul. And next we see him trying to destroy the church in Acts 38. He was trying to kill Christian people. He was dragging them back, and when and he was part of the Sanhedrin. And when they, when they when they voted whether or not to execute those people for being Christian, he voted against them by his own story and conviction. So he was trying his best to destroy the church. And in Acts 9, 3 to 6, as he neared Damascus on his journey, and you know this story very well, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul spent the rest of his life, Paul, spent the rest of his life spreading the gospel that he was trying to destroy among the Gentile world. He had some time that he spent uh, in training that, to, to get a grip on what this gospel was about. But he had a drastic turnaround. And every time you get saved, it's a drastic turnaround. I had a drastic turnaround. We all did. We all did. From going our own way, turn around and go God's way, that's drastic. But here's a guy who's trying to stop everything he can do to stop this new sect, and it was called the way back then. So based on his own convictions as a Pharisee, he thought he was doing the right thing for the Jewish nation and the Jewish faith. But there's a scripture in Proverbs 14, 12 that says, there's a way, there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. He experienced such a powerful conversion that he became an apostle and a major proponent of the gospel in the population centers of the Gentile nations. And this was spoken 
in the hearing of King Agrippa, this is in Acts 26, 10 to 15, and he said to King Agrippa, and that is just what I did. In Jerusalem, on the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities, and that's why he was on the way to Damascus, to hunt them down. Verse 12, on one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest about noon King Agrippa, I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I answered, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. I don't know how often or how long or how many years he was trying to ruin the church before this happened. I don't know. I don't know how long that was. But it must have been some time, and he must have had some considerable success in that. And Jesus had to rescue the church by converting this man, Saul, to the faith and having him be one of the ones who would carry the gospel for the rest of his life. Paul is said to have been beheaded in A.D. somewhere between 62 and 65, probably just outside of Rome. He was from Tarsus of Cilicia, which is now in Turkey. He was born a Roman citizen, and he was a Jewish Pharisee. He was determined to crush, kill, and destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Through a series of events, he finds himself in prison in Rome. And this was during the persecution of Nero, the evil emperor of Rome. And it was, this was the first, I think, of ten persecutions from Nero to Diocletian. And he has a, he's had a lifetime of personal hardship and great victories for God. Hardship for him, you'd look at all the things he went through and he made a, a list of them, uh, stonings and beatings and lashings and shipwrecks. He made a list and you'd think those were all um, horrible things and they were, but, they, but in doing all that he was able to accomplish great things for God, not for himself, and he was eventually executed. But he, he was in a very uncomfortable bondage, waiting to be executed. And this letter was written to his great personal friend, Timothy. We could call him Pastor Timothy. He was a young pastor that was sort of mentored by Paul. In verse 11, he was appointed by Jesus himself to be a herald. That means an announcer apostle, one who is sent with the message, and a teacher. So verse 12, he says, that's why I am suffering. He is suffering because he's carrying the light of the truth into a dark, sinful world. He spent years invading the territory of the enemy. 2 Timothy 1.12, that is why I am suffering as I am, yet this is no cause for shame. There is no cause for shame in suffering is if the suffering is a result of service to God. Christian missionaries, you know, they give up all hope of ever having a normal life. They give that up for the sake of the gospel. There is no shame in giving all that you are and all that you have and all that you ever will be for the gospel. And if you get... Um, Murder in the end of it, there is no shame in that because you have done what God wants you to do. Jesus withheld, withheld nothing, but he endured the cross for the sake of sinners. And the Bible says, because I know whom I have believed. Because I know whom I have believed. 
He was able to say, I know him. Not I know about him. Not from learning. Not from the law and the priests and the prophets. And he was a very learned man. He was trained under Gamaliel, one of the great Jewish scholars of the time. He was an expert in the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. But his knowing God was not from all that expertise, but it was from his faith conversion. His faith conversion. And he said, I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted him to, uh, to against that day. When you get saved, you are entrusting your very soul. Not the life that you breathe in and breathe out in the heartbeats, but the eternal life you're entrusting that to him. And he was suffering for God, Acts 9, 15 to 16. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man, referring to Paul, is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So God ordained that Paul would suffer in carrying the gospel. I will show him. The Lord said this to Ananias. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And I don't think that was because he had caused the church to suffer. It just was God knew that he would suffer. And so, as so many uh, Christian missionaries have and still do suffer. You know, there are, there are Christian people in, in North Korea and, if, and that's a death sentence if they catch you. You go to prison in Iran if you're trying to share the gospel with somebody. So there is suffering still in, the, in this world, but um, Paul, his claims are first that he knows his time is near. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. He knows he's going to be executed, but he knows how much he has spread that gospel, how many churches he has started, how many of those people have become ministers. He knows that. And secondly, that his reward is beyond the confines of this hostile world. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You count yourself in that? In that? You long for his appearing? Paul was a great man of God. He was one of the, this was one of the greatest turnarounds in Christian history. There have been many. But he showed us how to face hardships for God. Can we be like Paul? Can we be like that? Shipwrecks, beatings, stoning, riots, brought before kings, imprisoned, and finally sentenced to death. Can we be like that? Can we endure that much suffering with the joy that we have shared our gospel faith? Can we do that? We can. The question is, will we? You can go to places in the world today where being a Christian will get you killed. You can go to college campuses today where they, where they will leer at you and jeer at you and persecute you the best they can because of your Christian faith. We, you're, there are places where they will, you will get in prison for sharing your faith. Now there's open hostility in this country to the gospel and to God himself and to God's people. Open hostility. It's not veiled anymore. The following are excerpts from an article that I found that was posted by Michael Hall in a site called townhall.com. And I didn't, uh, I didn't include all this here because it was too lengthy and, and uh, it would take too long. But it says, this was on November 7th, post 2018. It says, on Sunday, the day of the church massacre, they were talking about a massacre that had happened. 
Cultural commentator David French tweeted, the amount of anti-Christian hate on Twitter the same day Christians were massacred is stunning and chilling. There was hatred towards Christians tweeted on the day of a massacre. This was in reference to a 2017 shooting at First Baptist Southern Springs in Texas. 26 deaths, including an unborn child. I don't know if you remember that. I remember it. And the writer continues, if ever there was a time when we might have expected sympathy for Christians, or at least restraint in attacking them, the opposite proved true for too many, far too many times. Why? He's asking. On Fox News, Laura Ingram noted that some of the reactions to the shooting pointed to elite hostility to people of faith. Stating that hostility to faith infects the popular culture. She also spoke of rising militant secularism, drawing attention to comments which mocked the prayers of believers on behalf of those affected by Sunday's church massacre. <clears throat> That's just one. Another website called Town Hall posted seven examples of discrimination against Christians in America. Number one, a Florida ministry was told to choose between Jesus and helping the poor. It says, for the past 31 years, the Christian ministry has been providing food to hungry to the hungry in Lake City, Florida, without any problems. But all that changed when they said a government when they said a government worker showed up to negotiate a new contract. State Agriculture Department officials had uh, told them that they would not be allowed to receive USDA food unless they removed portraits of Christ, the Ten Commandments, a banner that read Jesus is Lord and stop giving Bibles to the needy. When the government tells the Christian Service Center it has to give up on Christ or quit using USDA food to help the poor, that's religious discrimination. Second one, Billy Graham Evangelistic Association said Obama's IRS was targeting and attempting to intimidate us. It's well known that the IRS targeted Obama's political enemies in the Tea Party, but the IRS also targeted his Christian enemies, that is, Obama's Christian enemies, in the Billy Graham Event Evangelistic Association. And each one of these continued, but I can't, there's no time to read all of it. California, number three, Christians found not guilty of reading of reading Bible near government offices. A court has said that a pair of Christians were allowed to read the Bible aloud outside the Department of Motor Vehicles in Hemet, California. So it says, wasn't it kind of the government courts in California to say that these Christians weren't allowed to have their rights to free religious expression? Back in 2011, Mark Mackey and Brett Coronado were arrested and charged with misdemeanor offenses for reading the Bible outside the DMV location. But on August 13, Superior Court Judge Timothy Freer found the men not guilty of any offenses. Interestingly, the judge also pointed out that the law, that the, that the law prosecutors tried to invoke was likely unconstitutional as it gave law enforcement over broad powers to quash public gatherings in the first place. Sadly, this case did not go towards selling the constitutionality of the law, but it was a victory of sorts to have the judge even mention the fact. So what they're saying is that they're found not guilty of reading this Bible, but they should never have been in a question about it. Number four, Colorado Baker, you have heard about this one, faces a year in jail for refusing to make a cake for a gay wedding. You've probably all heard about that. You can support gay marriage or you can be Christian, but you can't do both. You can pretend
tend to do both, but you're giving up your Christian beliefs to be more palatable to people who are hostile to Christianity. Number five, Air Force veteran force faces a court martial for opposing gay marriage. Under Barack Obama, the military has become aggressively anti-Christian and pro-gay to such an extent that the troops are no longer even allowed to privately oppose gay marriage. Privately! Number six, government forces churches to get permits for baptisms. Did you ever hear this one? It was struck down, but they tried. Nevertheless, Park Service recently began a new policy requiring churches that wish to hold baptism in, in public waters to apply for a special permit at least 48 hours in advance of the baptism. The Park Service justified this recent demand by saying that permits were necessary to maintain park, natural, cultural resources, and quality visitor experiences. <laughs> Specific terms and conditions have been established. Now, they did overturn that. But the nerve of them in the first place, you can't go down to, uh, in this particular area, down to uh, Racetown or Canoe Lake or, or, or Shawnee or one of those lakes and have a baptism on the beach. You, and you, I mean, people do that. But it was public waters they were trying to put a stop to that by having them get permits. Number seven, Florida professors, professor demands student stomp on Jesus. It all started with a conflict between an antagonistic professor and one brave student at Florida Atlantic University. Ryan Rotila was told by his professor to write Jesus Christ's name on a piece of paper and stomp on it. It's going on in taxpayer funding schools. You're paying for that guy's for that guy's salary. Rotella defiantly refused that in retaliation a formal disciplinary action was started against him because he wouldn't stomp on Jesus' name. But before the system could roll over Rotella, a funny thing happened. The word about what was happening to him got out. Christians became outraged, and suddenly the university's tune quickly changed. So, the guy is still teaching there, but they waved off his disciplinary action against the student. Lamentations, chapter 3, 21 and 26 says this, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. The people Believers that Paul brought back to Jerusalem were bound for destruction, literally. Bound for destruction. Paul himself was bound for a greater destruction, which was eternal separation from God, the flames of hell. The people he brought back were bound for physical destruction, but they were bound for eternity with God. But he was bound for destruction of separation from God until the Lord intervened. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Those are Paul's words to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 to 4, I know a man in Christ, who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise 
and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. And people, scholars think, and I agree, that that was actually him, that he was stoned and he was actually dead and went to heaven and God sent him back. I know a man. So he knew whom he, he believed and he was persuaded that he was able to keep that which I committed up against, uh, against that day. John 14, 1 to 6, do not let your hearts be troubled. See, if you're suffering as a Christian, and you see people suffering. The enemy wants you to be in fear. He operates in fear and hatred. But don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. These are Jesus' words. My Father's house has many rooms, if that were not so. For I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. Amen. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Good old Thomas <laughs> came up, come up with stuff like that. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But he starts it by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. And some of the people he was talking to lost their life for their faith. They were murdered. They were they were murdered. They were they were massacred and and, and martyred in horrible ways. Let not your hearts be troubled. Because where you're going with me is so much so awesome that all this really is pale. So Paul was suffering for the faith. But he did, not have, he did not have a troubled heart. He was suffering. But he didn't have a troubled heart. Because he knew God. He, didn't, he knew that he would go to God. He had a glimpse of it. And he received as a good and faithful servant. That's what he heard from God when he went there. Good and faithful servant. How, how about you today? Do you, have, do you have the kind of knowing that Paul had? Can you say that your heart is not troubled? Even though you may be suffering for the cause of the gospel, even though you see suffering, even though you see things happen in the world, does it trouble your heart? be troubled. In other words, let's not fret about these things that are going to happen. Paul's perils, recorded in 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. He says, Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Beside everything else I face daily the pressures of my concern for all the churches. So Paul had much more torment and physical suffering I think that any Christian missionary or believer has ever had, has ever had, that he was still a warrior of the cross to the very end. And he didn't fret about it. He never, he, he never fretted about what he was going through. He just did it. 
Psalm 37, 1 to 10, do not fret because of those who are evil or be angst or envious of those who do wrong. So we see evil things happening in, we see it in the schools, we see it in universities, we see it in the government, in the highest places. Don't fret because of those who do evil. Verse 2, for like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness, your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. In other words, it doesn't say that he's going to destroy the people that you feel threatened to your faith. It doesn't say that. He's going to make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. Like the dawn. What is his righteous, what is the righteous reward? It's Jesus himself. He's our righteous reward. He is. Be still, verse 7, before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not, here's that word again, do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Now we see that all around us today. But don't fret, it says. Wait patiently for the Lord. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. Here's that word again. Because it only leads to evil. Verse 9, for those who are evil will be destroyed. But those whose hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Verse 10, a little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Amen. It's so easy to see what's going on and to fret. <laughs> it's just a natural tendency to fret and fuss. But we're to wait quietly for the Lord because God's going to take care of that. It's, it's going to be His vengeance. We tend to be uh, impatient we tend to want God, God, do something with those people, you know. Well, I do too, but I, I want him to save those people. And I'm not going to mention particular names, but you know who I'm talking about. Because this goes on YouTube, we probably would get canceled if I did that. <laughs> but you know who I'm talking about. In the highest parts of government, I pray that he will save those people. That a revival will sweep through the Congress and, and through the Senate revival. That would be the most awesome. That's what I pray for. But I'm not going to fret and fuss. You know, I'm not going to do that. And I just preached to you also not to do that. Just wait. Just wait. You know, people... People that get beat up when their kids in school say, just you wait, my big brother will take care of this. Well, our big brother's going to take care of it. But we just, we don't need to do that. We don't need to threaten. We don't need to fuss. All we need to do is pray for them. Pray for them. And see God work. Just the way he did in Paul. Paul was a menace. He was a menace to the church. He was evil. He was, he was unbelievable. The turnaround. We can see that. We can see that happen. We can. We pray for that. Would you stand and would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we do understand that we will suffer for our faith. We accept that challenge, but we accept that that's going to happen. If that's what you want us to do, we'll go through that, Lord. Because we don't have to go through it alone. We don't have to go through it wondering anything. We just have our faith in you, and that's what we need. And we will wait quietly for you as your word has instructed us, Lord. But the people who caused the suffering, who were the very agents of Satan in our high places in government, we come before you, Lord, to ask that you touch their lives, that you bring victory, the victory of God, that you change their hearts and their lives, 
and, the, and the, this country will turn around in one last great revival. We, we pray that a revival will break out in our youth and our young people, Lord, across the land, and they will and they will lead the way, Lord. We pray that our that our elected officials will just be so overwhelmed by the love of God that, that, that they will accept you as Lord and Savior. And they will start to preach that, Lord. Oh, Lord, we'd like to see that happen. Meanwhile, we'll take your word and we'll not fret, not fuss, but we will wait quietly because the vengeance is yours, Lord. It belongs to you. I love these people you've given me to talk to, Lord. I love these people. We do have love in this church. We thank you for that. And we just <clears throat> ask that you be with each one. Or until we meet again, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, board meetings.